In this video, I want to discuss some of the major cultural premises that we use in persuasive arguments and, uh, and that we use as persuaders. So I want to remind you, this is the third in a series of three videos related to the major premises that we use. We talked about uh, psychological premises or the tools of motivation in one video. Um, then we also talked about content premises in another video. In this video, we're taking on uh, our third and final topic in this series, which is cultural premises. So uh, just as a brief review, I want to remind you that, that all of these are what we call enthymematic persuasion. They're, they follow the enthymematic persuasion uh, model uh, set forth by our, our pal Aristotle, our friend Aristotle, who kind of looked at syllogism and said, you know, that's that's maybe uh, not the best way to persuade people, and and there may be a better way to do that. So he said, let's let's get rid of syllogisms. Let's just assume uh, that the major premise can go unstated. That that the major premise that we would normally have in a syllogism will be uh, unstated and that the audience will then supply that and we'll be on the same page. We'll be on the same wavelength with them, uh, but we'll just leave it unstated. And that will then provide, um, well, first of all, we have to be able to identify that common ground as a persuader to make sure that we're on the same page as the audience and, and to make sure that we're thinking the same thing that they are. But when we do, and when we can make that connection, it encourages a significant co-creation of meaning uh, between the audience and the per persuader and establishes a, a really strong connection in that way as well. So, as I said, we've looked at three different um, types of enthymematic per persuasion, uh, three different routes of enthymematic per persuasion, if you will. And those are on the process or the, the, uh, the psychological um, uh, premises that we use sometimes. Uh, we've looked at content premises, and in this our third and final video, we'll be looking at cultural uh, premises that are rooted in the values and behaviors and beliefs that are passed down um, by our culture. So let's start off just by briefly talking about what is culture. If we're going to talk about cultural premises, we need to be on the same page with what culture is. Well, culture is the learned and shared set of values or set of symbols, language, values, and norms used to distinguish one group of people from another. So what we're going to really focus on here are these, these two things, uh, learned and shared, and then the, that set of uh, symbols, values, uh, symbols, language, values, and norms uh, that we use to establish culture. Okay. So just some real quick principles of cultural premises. As we talked about, this operates in enthymematic persuasion. So we're leaving the, the major premise unstated and, and the audience is supplying that. And then the, the persuaders identifying that major, pers major premise as well and moving on as though it's, it's assumed then by both parties. I uh, just rely on our inherent cultural values and suppositions. So the things that we take for granted as part of our culture and that are established as part of our culture. And we need to remember that the elements of that culture are learned and shared. It's not something that's born into us, but it's something that is passed down to us from those around us. It's part of our the enculturation process as part of our maturation as people. And uh, so we so we gain our culture from um, by, by we learn our culture from from those around us and, and those who are, are raising us and have an influence on us. And then we in turn share that culture in the same way with those that are within our sphere of influence, if you will. So um, so the elements of culture are learned and they are shared. It's important to, to keep that in mind that it's passed down. So we're going to take a look at uh, three different kinds of cultural premises here in this in this video. Uh, the first are culture cultural images or myths. And we'll, we'll go through what we mean by, by all those, some, but some various cultural images or myths that we use and can use in persuasion or commonly used in persuasion. We'll take a look at, at the impact of e image or ethos and how that can be impactful for a persuader. And then finally, we'll specifically focus on some American value, the American value system and how uh, that is used in the persuasive process. Starting off, let's take a look at some cultural images and myths. So let's begin with what we call the wisdom of the rustic, the wisdom of the rustic. We like to look back at people who are from, you know, kind of humble beginnings and who pull themselves up by the bootstraps again, and particularly uh, as, as people who are from westernized culture and individualized, uh, individualistic cultures. Um, we, we love people who just rise above their, their, their status and, and are able to, uh, to do great things. We look at people, uh, like Davy Crockett and we look at people like Abraham Lincoln and we look at their humble beginnings and say, look what these people were able to accomplish. And, and so we, we use them as, as to kind of templates to say, look, I'm a simple person as well. 
I'm a simple person as well. And we've seen this in, in various uh, presidential campaigns. Joe Biden did it recently uh, by con continually talking about how he's just a humble guy from Scranton and a humble guy from, from Delaware, but, you know, his small town roots and, you know, his dad lost his job and so forth and he rose above a station. Bill Clinton did the same thing by identifying that he was from Hope, Arkansas. All the time he's always talking about he was the man from Hope. He was from this real humble beginnings and, and able to, to achieve because of, uh, because of his, uh, his drive and his, you know, but he's hearkening back to those days when we looked for those, to those people for heroes. Ronald Reagan did the same thing. Humble beginnings in Dixon, Illinois, worked as a lifeguard, you know, worked his way all the way up through the system and, and so forth to become the president of the United States. But that, but he was, you know, kind of connected as an every man and, and, uh, and so we do that. We reach back to these people for, for inspiration and, and say, look, these people did it. And so can we, the possibility of success is another, uh, cultural image or myth that, that, you know, everybody has an opportunity here, right? That's the American dream. Is it not and that anybody has the opportunity to do anything as long as they put in the work and have the drive and, and take advantage of those opportunities and things. Anybody can, anybody can be president, right? Anybody can be president. Anybody can be CEO of the biggest company in the world. Uh, anybody can do the possibility of success is there. That's part of our culture. That's part of, it's a cultural myth that we have. And we love talking about these and we are, we are inspired and persuaded by these things, by this possibility that we can be and do anything that we want. The coming of a Messiah. And we're not talking, you know, about the Christian heritage and things like that. We're talking about when society finds itself in a difficult place, right? If society finds itself in a crossroads if society finds itself in a difficult situation, or when a person perceives that to be the truth, um, then we start to look for, well, who's going to save us? There's somebody who's going to come along and save us. So one uh, recent example of this, uh, again, like it or not, is, is the, the Donald Trump ascension to the presidency. Right, the America was kind of at a crossroads. We're kind of wondering, you know, who are we? And and people were dissatisfied. And so here comes our Messiah, telling us everything that we want to hear, telling us how he can solve all these problems. He's done it before. He's pulled himself up by up by his bootstraps. Right, he tried to pull in that wisdom of the rustic um, thing, although you know, somewhat diminished by the fact that he inherited his first millions of dollars from his dad. But but still. Many people see Trump as the coming of the Messiah, sometimes politically and other times even further than that, right? The, the QAnon myth uh, postulated that he was literally going to be saving us from, you know, people in Hollywood and people in positions of power from this deep state uh, people who, who, uh, who were, you know, prostituting children and running, running, uh, you know, sex rings and, and even eating children to gain their, I don't even remember what it's called, but to gain something that will help them retain their youth. And that Trump was the one person who was going to be able to conquer this. That was the whole QAnon myth, right? So, uh, so he was, you know, in their eyes, almost literally the coming of a Messiah, not just politically, but, uh, but societally as well. Uh, the presence of a conspiracy. We are persuaded when we think that there's a, you know, because we feel like, honestly, when there's a big problem, it must have a big and elaborate answer, right? And the big elaborate causes behind us, there, there can't be anything simple. If it's a complex problem, there's no simple solution and there's no simple reason for it. So we, we in some cases, invent or, or, or want to put in place the presence of a conspiracy. So again, not to belabor a point, but... <laughs> You know, we come back to this whole QAnon thing and, and, you know, there's no simple answer for why society was facing some of these issues. And so we create, and people bought into this, you know, whether it was a joke to begin with, whether it was serious to begin with, I don't know, but people bought into this whole huge conspiracy, right? Because it, it's a complex issue and lots of complex things going on. So there must be a hugely complex solution as well that involves Trump being elected president and then being able to, to harness that power and do, I mean, all kinds of stuff that I don't, I don't even understand. I certainly can't, I don't have the time to get into in this video, but but the presence of a conspiracy uh, is a powerful persuader as well. If we can convince people that there's a conspiracy, which in some cases we are predisposed to believe, uh, then, then we can use that as a pers an effective persuasive tactic. The value of a challenge is something that we hold dear as a, as a, as a cultural image as well, right? Anything worth having is worth working for. And there's, there's value in challenging ourselves and pushing ourselves, right? We, we, we remember the time when in 1960 or 1961 in his inaugural address, when John F. Kennedy said, we will land a man on the moon. I mean, at that time, that was so outrageous a claim that, that there was no, I mean, we weren't even close to that. That wasn't even a possibility really. Um, and yet within 10 years of him saying that, um, we landed on the moon. 
right? Which is pretty amazing. So we were able to, to achieve that in just 10 short years, which is phenomenal, right? So we could, because we like to challenge ourselves. We see ourselves as people who are able to overcome those challenges, which is why the army slogan uh, that you they used to have that slogan, be all that you can be, right? Be all you can be, challenge yourself, get out there and push yourself, which is why, you know, we uh, are drawn to, to things like challenge accepted. If you're a, how I met your mother fan, well, yeah, we're not going to turn down a challenge. We're going to, we're going to challenge ourselves. And which I even more reason I've seen these ads for uh, the, the exercise bikes and different things. And, and there's one that's a, a home, uh, it's basically a punching bag, but it's got a, it's connected to a electronics. I don't know. It works you through a whole workout thing. Why do we you know, look at these things and say, yes, that's great. I want somebody to yell at me through a TV screen while I'm riding an exercise bike. I want somebody to push me uh, when I'm hitting this punching bag. I want somebody on the video screen because we enjoy challenges. We find value in a challenge. We find that that brings us to higher levels. And, and so we, we are persuaded when somebody challenges us, when somebody can, can provide that challenge for us. That's a, that's a powerful persuasive tool. Uh, and then finally, the last cultural image or myth that I want to look at is the eternal return. The eternal return, basically looking back and saying, look, these guys had it all figured out. These people had it all figured out. So we can draw from that, that it's happened before, that these people were perfect. And so we do this a lot, like, for example, with the, the founding fathers of the United States, right? We look at them and say, well, they had it all figured out. You hear politicians all the time say, well, our forefathers did this and they said this and they set this forth in the Constitution. And the truth is the forefathers, first of all, they were not perfect. They were not perfect, right? George Washington had a pretty big stick up his butt. He was kind of like overly serious. John Adams was the same way. He's very rigid. And I love John Adams, but he was very rigid in his perspective of the world and the way he looked at things. I mean, Thomas Jefferson, historically, uh, you know, has clearly had had uh, had affairs with with multiple slaves had maybe children with some of his slaves and owned slaves several of them owned slaves ben franklin was a was an inveterate womanizer he was constantly <laughs> unfaithful to his wife but they all did great things that's not to diminish the great things they did in founding the united states and setting all this forth but i think if you would if you we were able to ask them they would each say we didn't have it all figured out we don't know but that's what we put on them to say look I'm just trying to emulate what these people are doing because they were basically perfect and they had it all figured out. And that's what we need to do. That's a powerful, powerful persuasive tool. Again, to pull forth this, this is what I'm trying to, as a persuader, when you're saying I'm trying to, all I'm trying to do is recreate what our forefathers were able to do, right? I'm just trying to bring us back into what they were able to do. Uh, so that's the myth of the eternal return. So we shift gears a little bit here and move out of the cultural myths and, uh, and move into another area of cultural persuasion that we call uh, image or ethos. And this is basically saying that the, we're drawn to people because of our belief in them, because of their image, because of, their, uh, because of the credibility that we perceive them to bring. And it really comes down to these three things that draw us to people as, as persuaders, as a, as a culture, that we're drawn to three primary things when we think about uh, somebody's image or ethos and whether or not we're going to be persuaded by them. First of all is expertise. We are persuaded by, by you know, uh, inherently by people with uh, who seem to bring an expertise to that area. So, you know, we're talking about something medical and somebody says, well, I'm a doctor and so forth. You know, th th that's very persuasive, right? Now we need to be careful because there have been, for example, talk show hosts, radio and TV talk show hosts who say, yes, I'm doctor so-and-so and, -so and, doc and they, they may be doctors, and they're, but they're dispensing all this advice about medicine and healthy living and lifestyle choices and things like that come to find out that they are a doctor but they have a you know phd in english literature or something like that not any kind of expertise but we hear that word doctor and we think oh this is an expert because we're persuaded by that or an expert in any area so if we can establish as persuaders some sort of expertise then we are going to be likely more persuasive than than we might otherwise be uh, trustworthiness Again, lots goes into trustworthiness, but if we find somebody trustworthy, then it stands to reason that we're going to be more drawn to them. Again, these are, these are the things we find that studies have shown in our culture that, that these are, these are characteristics of people can convey these things that, uh, that we are more likely to be persuaded by them. So if we can convey this sense of trustworthiness in our, in our image and in our ethos, that we are more likely to be uh, persuasive than other people. And then dynamism, if we can, if we can, you know, provide some charisma 
you know, people feel connected to us, um, then, then that's another thing. That's why you see a lot of, uh, actors and people promote, you know, that are, that are brought in to promote products and things like that, uh, because they have this dynamism, this sense of uh, character and charisma and, and even outside of, of, uh, uh, of, you know, selling things exactly or advertising. Um, you look at one of the reasons that, uh, that Ronald Reagan was so successful and, and he was called the great communicator was because he had this dynamism. I mean, the man was an actor professionally, right? He did that for many, many years. So he knew how to connect with an audience. He knew how to, he knew how to tell a story, he knew how to convey information in, in an effective way. So, um, he had that dynamism, right? That, 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 some, that sense of character and that, that, uh, that charisma that went a long way. So the, these things individually are very powerful, uh, persuasive tools collectively. They are really strong, uh, persuasive tools. And so we should consider, you know, our image and our ethos and, and how that affects the willingness of, of people in our culture to accept what it is that we're saying. And then the final thing I want to talk about here is the American value system and how that plays into persuasion, how it can be used to persuade and also how it's used to persuade us. Right. So uh, we need to be uh, conscious and aware of both of those things. So the American value system, um, starting with the Puritan and pi uh, pioneer morality, the sense of morality that we feel like the Puritans and the, and the pioneers had when they came here that we are drawn to. And, uh, it's, you know, again, one of the reasons in politics, we talk so much about family values, even from, you know, when we're persuaded by that talk, even from people who uh, don't display any sense of family values, right? That, but we're drawn to that because we, we feel connected to that Puritan and pioneer mora morality, right? So uh, then in the United States, we're also a very individualistic culture. We value the individual. So the value of the individual is something that we're persuaded by. When somebody's talking about our individual uniqueness and the value that we bring and, and the difference that one person can make, um, we, we value the individual. And we value somebody who goes against the grain. We value somebody who's willing to, to kind of stand up, so to speak, right against others. And so we, we that value of the individual is something that's a very persuasive tool. Achievement and success. You know, again, things we value in the United States, uh, we value achievement and success as an individualistic culture. We, we kind of place the, the, the me above the we. And so we look for that individual achievement, individual accomplishment, individual success. So if we, when we can persuade people that, that that is possible and that's something that we can help them uh, achieve, then, um, then they're going to be persuaded by that. Or if we can convince them something that we have achieved and they're going to be uh, persuaded by that, they're going to find us, you know, again, that, that expertise is going to be uh, important. Change and progress is another one. Change and progress uh, is, a, is an American value. We don't hold on to things as much as other cultures do. We, we tend to, to move forward. We, we want progress. As Tony Robbins says, change is inevitable. Progress is optional. And in, in the United States, we tend to choose that. Uh, you, you can look around our landscapes, for example, and just look at that. We don't tend to hold on to, we, we, to buildings, for example. When a building gets older and ages, then we tend to tear it down to make way for the new, right? In other cultures, they don't really do that as much. They, they hold on to those older buildings. They have a different, uh, different notion of, of change and progress and the importance that those things have. So, um, so when we can persuade people using the idea that, that progress is necessary and this is what progress will take and so forth, then people are going to find that uh, appealing. Continuing on in that same vein of the American value system, we value ethical equality we, with the sense of equality. Now we don't always achieve it as we, as we know, we've had, you know, horrible histories with, with, um, racial prejudice and bias and, uh, you know, stemming back to, to slavery and things like that. It took us forever to come to any sense of equality between the sexes and, uh, and, and start to even look at uh, women as equals to men, for example. So, but you know, again, we're, we're a work in progress, so to speak, and we at least uh, ostensibly value equality and want that equality. So, um, so if we can you know, make a case based on equality, um, that's something that's going to be, um, Pers uh, persuasively effective for us. Effort and optimism, this idea that hard work pays off, that if you put in the time and you put in the energy and, and you know, you put in the required resources and so forth, that, uh, that you're going to get there in the end. That's an American value as well. So that's something else that we used to sell things on. And we used to sell people on that idea. Uh, but you know, even though we know it doesn't always, you could work all your life very hard and still not end up with much, but, 
but that's not the American way. We have this with have this inherent optimism, this dream that, you know, if I put the time and I put the effort in, then I'm going to get what's coming to me. I'm going to get I'm going to get what I deserve here. Um, so we can tap into that effort and optimism as a persuasive tool and tactic as well. And finally, efficiency, practicality, and pragmatism. And one of the best examples of this, you know, maybe this is because I grew up in a farming community and so forth, but but the the, the combine harvester. You know, is is I mean, it's literally the in there in the name. It combines several functions that make have made for I mean, tremendous progress in helping farming uh, become more efficient and more practical and more pragmatic. Uh, it, it it combines several functions that used to used to take um, you know several passes through to get these accomplished. Well, this this accomplishes multiple things at one time, and, and that increases the efficiency. It increases the ability of one person to farm uh, more land. And, uh, and you know, so, uh, so you don't need as many people to farm as much land and one person can do much, much more uh, now than they could before. Thanks to that, that combine harvester and, and, and the, the productivity that that provides. Um, it's also very, you know, very, very practical. Uh, it does, it does a job very specifically and, and it combines several. Anyway, that's what we're all about. What can we do to make our lives more efficient? What can we do to, to help increase our productivity and, and to what, what's practical uh, around us? And, and so um, we're in some ways more concerned with, with function than fashion, many of us are. So uh, that's an American value as well. And we can tap into that when we persuade people that if we convince them that what we're doing is, is going to increase our efficiency and our practicality and so forth, uh, then, then that's a persuasive tactic. So anyway. Lots of things to look at here with culture and lots of methodologies through which we can persuade people using cultural values and, and cultural premises, right? So again, we look at these three different types of, of persuasive um, processes and premises, right? The process premises, the, the content premises, and the cultural premises. We have lots of options, lots of methodologies, all uh, based in that, that uh, the enthymematic persuasion uh, method of Aristotle. If you have questions about any of this, about cultural uh, premises or about any of the other enthymematic premises that we've, uh, and persuasive tactics that we've talked about, please feel free to email me. I'd be happy to, to, um, to connect with you via email. Uh, in the meantime, again, not be on the lookout, not only for ways that you can use cultural premises and persuasion, but also be aware of when others are using that with you so that we can be uh, more effective uh, you know, receivers and audiences of persuasion as well. Happy communicating.